Okay, so this is Dr. Morton. This is uh, DSD number 17, and we're going, we're on um, Unit 5, SM Charts. So this is, I think, uh, very useful material and pretty important, and, uh, and I do want you to pay particular attention to this. Unit 4, a little less so, um, those mathematical things where we're doing... Uh, 4-bit integers with 4 bits of uh, fractional portion and doing signed, you know, multiplication. All those things are pretty esoteric and not something I, I really care that you uh, spend a lot of time on. Um, but this I think you do need to know and be pretty good at because this will really help you do uh, develop your own um, uh, sequential designs, your own state, state solutions. All right, um, so... Without any further ado, we'll kick this off. I'm going to shrink this down, and we'll cover SM charts and microprogramming. Now, microprogramming, is, I think you should still know about this. Uh, I, I, what we're re I think what we really see today is kind of a variation on microprogramming, so we don't, we don't really see microprogramming per se so much, but, uh, but some of the same techniques are used. So when we make a microprocessor and we... Uh, and, and we want to uh, pipeline it and optimize it and do branch prediction. Uh, it's very difficult to do that with an instruction register that, that's hardwired to, uh, to uniquely decode all possible instructions. So that's not what's done. Typically what's done is they, they have a little micro-coded uh, machine running at the CPU level that takes the instruction and the, the, the little micro machine has a very, very limited number of uh, instructions. Uh, and, it, and it uses its very limited number of instructions to actually implement the, more, the slightly more complicated, but probably still reduced instruction set um, machine language instruction. And, and this little micro code that's running underneath is similar to the microcode we're talking about, but it but it's also a little different. This this microcode is is one way to implement that, uh, but they're actually uh, the way this is I think classically implemented. Um, you you basically have a small, super simple but very fast computer running underneath the actual computer that implements the instructions. Now the reason they do that is because if you have this computer underneath the computer executing the instructions, then then it's a lot easier to to optimize and pipeline it and branch predict it and multi-thread it than it would be if you didn't have that. And so that's that's why they typically do that, I think. Although some of those details, uh, you know, will leave for uh, um, for computer architecture courses. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's good to go through it. It at least gives you some idea about ways in which these things can be implemented efficiently. Okay. So, uh, so you did you did the ROM lab, um, and in the ROM lab, uh, there there it actually works a little better if you just go ahead and put a clock into the into the mix, uh, and if you're not careful, uh, if you just try and implement it uh, with a uh, always block with an at star notation, you'll find that it it doesn't work very well for all sorts of reasons. Uh, so anyway, but I but we've talked about that, and also last week uh, on Monday I talked about uh, uh, the the next lab. Let's see. Let me make sure. I, I think I probably have this up here somewhere. Uh, that's yeah. That's micro. Yeah. Okay. So if I if I put this up, um, and we go down the labs, so. So I I talked about I talked about lab six last week. So that's the lab we're going to do this week. I I got mixed up. I didn't talk about lab five. So hopefully you've already figured out lab five. Lab five is super easier than lab six, and so so lab six will be a little more complicated because we are going to multiplex the display. And if you're confused about that, go back to the lecture from uh, from last Monday. And, and review it, and I think it'll help you with Lab 6, because I already covered it in Lab 6. Okay, um, so. All right, back to the ROM. So um, so anyway, so when you add a clock, it, it makes a big difference. And uh, 
when you uh, put a clock in, the ROM looks like this. It's a lot more palatable than than some of the uh, schematics I saw. <laughs> so this is a lot simpler, and and uh, it it's really because the FPGA just kind of likes to have a clock. Um, so anyway, all right, we're going to talk about state machines. We're going to derive the SM charts, and then we're going to implement them. And we can do all that without going through state tables, transition tables, uh, k-maps, and the like. We can just write the equations out. The only downside is uh, it's a little difficult to, to, to optimize them with the don't cares unless you do k-maps. But, um, but it's a lot faster and not too bad. And then we'll talk a little bit about microprogramming and um, maybe the link state machines. We'll see. All right. So SM charts. So you have had this because I covered it in logic design. And in fact, there were probably two or three problems involving state machine charts on your final exam. And then more recently, uh, in the review of logic design, uh, since I used one of the finals from the previous semester uh, of logic design, you, got, you saw this again. So this can't be brand new. Uh, so I'm going to go through most of this setup pretty fast. So they're called SM charts, state machine charts, algorithmic state machine charts, ASMs, whatever. They look like a flow chart back in the days when we used to try and do flow charts for all our programs. But they're not really a flow chart. Uh, and they, they are a complete substitute for a state graph. If you have a state graph, you can just write the SM chart. If you have an SM chart, you can just write the state graph. But they're a little more useful than the state graphs, uh, even though they're so similar. And it's just because of the way we, we write them out. OK. The advantage of the SM charts over state graphs. So theoretically, a little easier to understand, uh, directly lead to behavior models and hardware realization. That's really the key advantage. I'm sure we can modify um, state graphs to get there, but, uh, but then we'd have SM charts, which is what we've got. All right, there are three major components uh, that you can have every single so uh, an SM chart is made up of blocks every block is one state every block requires a state box that gives the name of the state and any outputs that are associated with the state which would be more type outputs we also put up on the top our state our encoding scheme in flip-flops so if we have three flip-flops then state zero might be coded as A prime, B prime, C prime, and so forth. Or maybe not. Or you might have a lot of flip-flops, and you would encode it as a one-hot thing, or whatever. But whatever you're doing, you put it up at the top. All right? Then the uh, then if we have an input, we typically then have a decision box, and the condition in the decision box is typically an input. If we have several inputs, then you're going to have to have decision boxes uh, that include all the possible combinations. Uh, and then if... Uh, based on one link path that's active within a block that causes a melee output then you'll put that melee output in a conditional output list in that in that link path if a melee output is not listed then it's considered to be zero and if a and if a in the state box if a more output is not listed it's considered to be zero so that's just how that works so if you see it it's one if you don't see it it's zero all right so here's an example of an sm block. It has the state box. The state is S1. It has two more outputs, Z1, Z2. So whenever you're in S1, Z1 is 1 and Z2 is 1. You have an input X1, X2, and X3. And you're going to first check X1. If it's 0, you're going down this path. If it's 1, you're going down this path. And if you go down this path and X3 is 1, then you go out this way. If it's 0, then you have Z5 as a conditional output. Uh, and that's a more, that's a melee output, and and that means z5 equals one. If you go out any other path, z5 equals zero. Here, z3 and z4 equal one, and obviously z5 would be zero. But if you go out this path, z3 and z4 are zero because they're not listed over here. And then, depending on x2, you'd go out this way or that way. All right, so, you, so this has three decision boxes, two conditional output boxes, one state block. One of the rules is you can't have a re-entrant path inside the block. You have to go out and then come all the way back in. And there's only one path in, but there can be many paths out. 
All right, so here's a SM chart for this binary multiplier controller. Uh, so we have, uh, we have, in this case, state S0, state S1, and state S2, and S3, four states. So we also have this counter thing, K, that counts 1, 2, 3, 4, and, and when it gets, well, 0, 1, 2, 3, when it gets to 3, then you're done. Um, and then K, K, the output K will be 1 at that point. All right, so you start in S0, and you stay here until your start input, which is right here, until start is true. As long as it starts 0, you stay in state S0. And again, these would be considered a single input. All right, when starts 1, now you uh, have this conditional output load, so it loads a 1, which means you load up your, your multiplier. You load up your multiplier, you clear out the... Uh, what are going to become the product, uh, the partial product digits, and you uh, load up the uh, multiple can. And then uh, you're in S1. In S1, you check the multiplier bit, which is the lower order bit in the multiplier. If it's a 1, you add and then shift, and then you check K. If K is still 0, you do it again. If M is 0, you just shift check K. If K is still zero, you do it again. Now, this sort of incorrectly shows three three paths in. They should really, strictly speaking, they should all come back up and enter at the same point. Um, and these re-entrant paths are, have to leave the block and then come back into the block. And again, through the single entrance path. There should only be one entrance path. This is, you know, this shows two, this shows three, there, but you just have to visualize them as one. All right. And then S3, if K turns out to be 1, then you go to S3 and you issue the done. And then uh, on the next clock, you go back to S0 and wait for the next start signal. <sighs> and uh, we've sort of looked at this. I'm not going to go through this again, but this is for that multiplier. All right. So... How do you take your SM chart and realize your next state equations, which would be the inputs to your flip-flops? And you use D flip-flops for this. Um, so here's what you do. You take the chart, and you have at the top of every state block, uh, or every state box, you have written in your flip-flop encoding. So you identify all the states where the flip-flop you're interested in. Let's say you're doing A. So where all the, all the states where A equals 1. And you, you basically just, uh, uh, you or together all, all of the terms that uh, come from all the paths in to, every, to the state where A is 1. If there's only one, then you, if there's only one path, then there'll just be one term. But if there's several paths in, then there'll be several terms. And if there's several blocks where A is a 1, then you'll, then you'll have at least two and maybe several. And... Um, Okay, and then basically you just you just or all that together and you have an SOP expression and then you could simplify it. So let's see how this works. It's easier to do it than it is to talk about. So here's an example with three states, zero, S0, S1, and S2. You have uh, three uh, encodings and they're, uh, they're, not, they're not straight binary. This is zero, one, three. Okay, we, and we, there's nothing for state two. So even though you could have some don't cares for two, we're not going to consider that for this because it just it turns out we don't consider don't cares when we do it this way. All right, which is maybe the one weakness of this. All right, so let's say we want to we want to come up with the with the a input. All right, so this is this one is a equals zero, b equals zero. This is a equals zero, b equals one. This is a equals one, b equals one. So what blocks does? And let me put my face back up here somewhere. What blocks? Uh, do you see where where the input for where the flip flop a should be a one? Well, only down here s two. So now what we have to do is we have to uh, put together all the paths that go into s two. Well, there's one that comes from s one, and there's one that comes from s two itself. So we just write those paths. So the path that comes from s one starts with a prime b because that means we're in state s one and when x is 1. So that's going to be a prime b x. The other path that we have to account for comes from s2, so that's a b, 
And since it's when x equals 1, it's abx. abx, we, uh, we go out here, come back in up here. So, so a prime bx plus abx. Well, you obviously can drop the uh, a, and you're just left with bx. Okay, so so you see down here, we we have um, a equals a prime bx plus abx, and obviously that simplifies to just bx. What about uh, b? Well, there are two nodes where b where the b flip flop is a one. S1 and S2. So now we have to account for all paths into S1 and all paths into S2. Well, it turns out there's only one path into S1, and that is from, um, and let's see, I might have, no. And that is, um, and that's from S0. So that's A prime, B prime, X. Turns out X is 1. So, and then we've already done these. We already know that's a prime bx plus abx, which resolves the bx. So we just have a prime b prime x plus abx plus bx. So perfect. Um, and I think we can probably get rid of the b prime. So that should this should resolve to. Um, I I think it simplifies to. Uh, Yeah, uh, well, these these two combined to, well, these two combine to a prime x, and this combines to bx. So a prime x plus bx, and that's what it is. Okay. All right. Now, what about the outputs? Well, they're really even simpler. So we have a, a more output here, a more output there, and a more output there. So z a will be one whenever we have a prime b prime. ZB will be 1 whenever we have A prime B. ZC will be 1 whenever we have AB. So we just A prime B prime, A prime B, and AB. What about the uh, melee outputs? Well, so there's no melee output here. There's none here, but down here there are. And we have Z1 when we have A, B, X prime. We get a Z1. And when we have A, B, X, we get a Z2. And that's all there is to it. So that's pretty straightforward. And it's also a very efficient way to do these things. Uh, let's see, sorry. Okay, right. So uh, in, that, in this one, it's the same kind of thing. We have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, so straight binary order. So when we want to do the uh, the first one, we have uh, we get the we get the a prime b m prime k term here. So it's a prime b m prime k. So that that's that goes into this uh, node, uh, this this state, and and again this state doesn't have much going on, but. Uh, but a is a one here, a is also a one here, so we we also need well, and we need this input here. So we need, so we got that one. That's one path. Now we need the we need the path going in here. Well, this path. Okay, that's our second path into here. Then we need the path going in here. So this path is a prime b m. This path is a b prime k. So there it is. And then once you write all that out, you can simplify it. How about for the B? Well, B is zero here, but it's one here and it's one here. So we need, now we need, we need the path going in from Z, A prime B prime ST. Okay. And then we need, I've got another path here. So that's A prime B M prime K prime. This is a prime, no, sorry, this is uh, a b prime, k prime. And then we have to count for the two paths going in here. That is a b, or a prime b m prime k. And then we have one more path here, a 
b prime k. So, and then you simplify that and you're done. Okay. Um, all right. Now, what if we wanted to implement this with a uh, read-only memory? Okay, so here is a uh, here's a, a state transition table from the the problem we just looked at, and and now we've we programmed in uh, all the flip flop encodings and everything, and uh, what we have then is for state s zero, state s one, state s two, and state s three, uh, the values for the a and b that encode those states, and then uh, the uh, the start signal, the M signal, and the K signal, where they're relevant. And then the desired next states for A and B for each of these rows. And then, uh, then the other signals that have to be generated, load, shift, add, and done. All right, so, um, so load and done are pretty simple. And add and shift depend on uh, what, that, what the next, uh, what, what the multiplier digit is. Okay. All right. So the question is, how do you, how would you implement this using a ROM? So, well, it's, it's, that's one of the th critical skills you need to, you need to have. You need to be able to look at this and say, yeah, I can figure this out. I know how, I know how to size my ROM to implement this. So the first thing is how many independent variables are there? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five. And how many dependent variables? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So you're going to need a, you're going to need a ROM that has uh, six address lines. I'm sorry, five address lines and six outputs are six columns and two to the n, where n is five. So that's 32 rows, six output columns. So a 32 by six ROM. And how many address lines? Well, five, one for each of your independent variables. How many output lines? Six, one, one for each of the columns in the output. The flip-flop A, the D input for flip-flop A, the D input for flip-flop B, which we call A plus and B plus, or D sub A and D sub B, if you will. And then uh, the load signal, the shift signal, the add signal, and the done signal. All right, let's talk a little bit about microprogramming. This is a, a technique to implement the control unit for a digital system. Uh, and there, the, uh, so there's really two approaches. One is the microprogramming approach, and the other is hardwired. I mentioned this earlier. So if you pop an instruction in the instruction register, you can do one of two things. You can, so somewhere there's an opcode that's sitting there. Now, it, it may be variable in size, and that's one of the tricky parts, I think. But anyway, anyway uh, you can have... Uh, a set of hardware gates looking at that opcode and automatically generating the proper signal to implement whatever features that opcode is supposed to do. And, and it can be, it, 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 it could be a combinational output uh, and, you, and, and you would immediately generate, uh, you would immediately send control signals to get the rest of your the CPU guts to uh, go out to RAM and pull in the right value and either add them or subtract them or and them or or them or do whatever you're going to do and then output the result to the appropriate place. So you can hardwire all that and it's going to be pretty fast, but it's going to be very complicated. And the problem is if you want to fine tune one of your instructions, good luck. And if you want to modify it a little bit, good luck. And if you want to try and do pipelining with it, good luck. Very difficult to modify, to, to optimize, to, but it but it has the advantage of it's a little faster potentially. Now, if you want to use the microprogrammed, then basically you you store a, a series of control signals that are going to execute in a certain sequence, and they're going to implement that instruction. And uh, these. These control signals typically are stored in a read-only memory that's basically addressed uh, by the by the opcode that's in your instruction register. 
So if you really want to think about it, you, it gives you the choice between working out all the equations or using a read-only memory. That's really the bottom line. But there is a little more to it than that. For one thing, uh, when you when you microprogram it, you can uh, you have a lot easier time modifying it, and you have a lot easier time uh, uh, having multiple instructions uh, at different places in execution because you can replicate, and and then you can have uh, several of these little microprogrammed machines running, and you can have them talk to each other and update with intermediate results to, uh, to get a pipeline effect. And then you could even go crazier than that. You can start doing multi-threads, branch prediction, cache hits and misses, cache predictions, all sorts of crazy stuff. So when you do the hard wiring approach, uh, it's, it, could, it, it, it has the potential to be the fastest uh, controller. But the disadvantage is it's, it's pretty hard to debug and fix, and it's very hard to modify. A ROM is a lot easier to change. On the microprogramming side, uh, it has the advantages, easy to debug and fix, it's easy to modify. The disadvantage is that your, your microprogramming code has to scream not to slow things down. And that, that may be problematic. And in theory, it would never be quite as fast, I guess, as uh, as the hardwired um, approach. But uh, you could overcome that perhaps with pipelining because the advantage of pipelining is that you're actually working on more several instructions at the same time. So, so then you can slice your instructions up, speed your clock up, and you can pop out after the pipeline gets full, you can be popping out a, a finished instruction, uh, you know, at a much faster rate than you can if you execute the whole instruction and don't pipeline. Because pipeline allows you to, to, do in, to do some of the work in parallel. All right. Now the memory that we put this in can sometimes be called a control store or a microprogram memory, but it's just a ROM. That's all it is. And uh, it, it's been around for a long time, proposed in 51. The, 80, the 8086 and the 6800 used it. Uh, but we've kind of moved away from it, and I, I think partly what we moved away from is, is a similar system, but they just don't call it microprogramming anymore. Uh, they, they, uh, they still, they build a small, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a microcoded, I think is the right term. But anyway, it's running, it's running a set of instructions underneath your actual assembly language routine to actually implement those instructions, and, and that's what that's what I think where we are in the current technology. So it's, it's maybe slightly more than semantics, but only a little bit more in my view. All right. So there are a couple different ways to do this. So normally the way you'd set it up is you, you store in your, in your ROM, you store a test, and then you store next state if the test is false, next state if the test is true, and the appropriate outputs. So this is basically... A state machine, and uh, and the test uh, could be whatever. Uh, you the test then selects from all the various inputs which test is going to be, and then that the result of that test then selects next state if uh, if false, next state if true. So if your test comes out true, then the multiplexer here picks the next state if true side. And if it's uh, and then whatever's being sent, and usually these are several bits wide, uh, maybe even uh, you know maybe eight, maybe four or five or six bits wide. All right, so there's always two pos and and they set it up so there's only two possible next states, next state of true, next state of false. All right, and uh, so this is so you can think. Look, you could think of the back of the problem we just looked at with that ROM. And uh, here are all the uh, independent variables, are the outputs. All right, so to, uh, so we have to transform the state machine chart in order to implement this microcontroller.
So when you want to take uh, an SM chart like that, you have to transform it. And, and here's what you have to do. The first thing you have to, if you're going to implement it with a microcontroller, the first thing you do is you eliminate all the conditional outputs. In other words, you, you don't have any mealy outputs. They all have to be mores. They have to depend only on the state. Uh, and then, uh, then you allow only a single input qualifier per state. So states can't have uh, multiple uh, multiple input, you know, a whole bunch of different outputs. So every state only has one, you know, it's a, it becomes a binary choice for every state. Um, now, that, that'll likely increase the number of states, but it reduces the overall microprogram size because you get rid of some columns, and so it, it, it typically makes a big difference. All right. All right, so, so let's see how that works. So here, here, back to our little controller for the multiplier. So two steps. First, make all outputs more. So, uh, so, uh, so the add and the shift have to become mores. So we have to have a state for these. All right. So we switch these, and now we have a state. We call it. 1.2 and 1.1 and so so here the shift now is is associated with state 1.2 and the adds associated with state uh, state 1.1 and, th and this is add in and then we also then have the shift state um, okay but fortunately you can do state reduction and uh, these two can be shared okay now let's see uh, yeah, so now we've gotten rid of all of our mealies, and uh, and we have uh, only one qualifier per state. Start here, M here, K here, and K here. All right, and now here's here's how we implement it. Then, uh, so the test is so the test here is going to be start. The test here is going to be M. The test here is going to be K. So we have to pick between one, two three different tests. So this is going to have to be a two bit. Uh, it's going to have to be a four to one mux. And test is going to have to be two bits. And then since we have one, two, three, four, five, six states, our state's going to have to be a three bit. So three bits for next state of false, three bits for next state of true. And then our outputs will have to have, uh, we'll have to have, we have start, we have load, we have add and shift, and done. So one, two, three, so there's six. So that's what we had before. So the mug size depends on the number of qualifiers. And in this case, we, we have, um, uh, what did I say, four, I think? Anyway, all right, so, and those are the things we have to figure out. But, we can do state minimization. So combined states, well, obviously, S2 and S1.2 do the same thing. So all we have to do is combine these. And then, uh, so our test then is going to be two bits. And here's our test, start, M, and K. And then this is just a, a default test. And um, then, So this is the this is what this multiplexer looks like, and then we have three flip flops for our next state. So this this generates uh, this generates three outputs. Uh, well, yeah. So we have it's basically uh, it's it's three two to ones, okay. So you have three multiplexers, one for each one of these bits, and it's a two to one. So you have three two to one multiplexers. And then what, what's the ROM got to be? Well, so you have to have three bits here, two bits for test. Uh, so, and you, then, so you have, so, so this is, uh, so your inputs then are, is your state, it's three bits. And, uh, and then you have to have, yeah, so three bits for your state, that's it. 
So it should only have to have eight rows, but you have to have uh, two bits for here on your output, three bits, three bits, and five, uh, six, I think. So it's going to have uh, it's going to have uh, eight. It's going to have 14 columns, something like that. I believe that's right. So one, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I guess I didn't count right. Twelve columns. Oh, because there's only load, add, shift, and done. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so there it goes. And yeah, there's only yeah, load, add, shift, and done. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So here's our states, and we, we're going to have six states, or yeah, six states, zero through five. And boom, that's what we have to put in. So next state if false, next state if true, and the test. The test is either going to be zero, three, or one. We, we don't have a two. And that's pretty much it. And then these are the outputs, load, add, shift, and done. Three bits of three flip-flops to hold the result, so we have to have three external flip-flops. So our, our ROM is 6 by 12. Okay. Now, interestingly, you can even redo this uh, and get rid of uh, some of the uh, some of the columns because you can you can always have the you what you can do is you can have the test and then you can have the next state of true, but if it's but if it's false, so you remove the next state of false, and what happens? You just always default to the next stage, the next state, if it's false. So the next state is sequential if the qualifier is false. Only when it's true do you uh, jump to a different state than the next one. And that simplifies this a little bit. And so... So what you have to do is you have to have the this you have to have you have to make the the next state is sequential if the qualifier is false. So you have to rearrange this, renumber the states a little bit. So in this case, false, that's not going to work because uh, you have to go back to zero. So in this case, you you want you would probably make that uh, I don't know figure yeah you make it not start right. So then that works. And then the next state, if it's false, would be 1. So 0, 1. And then the next state's 2. And then again, the next state, if it's false, should be 3. But if it's true, then you can go to 5. And then from 3, uh, your next state, then if it's uh, false, is 4. So you have to make it k prime. And if it's 1, then you go back here. So only when k when k itself is one or k prime is zero are you done, and that's all there is to it. So you do those you do those modifications, and then now you can get by with uh, you can save three of the columns. So that's kind of nice. You just had to rearrange your your states a little bit. All right, and this gives a ROM size of six by nine. So not too bad. All right. So if you look at the comparison, the the ROM method off of an original SM chart, 32 by 6, two address microcode, 6 by 12, single address microcode, 6 by 9. Pretty cool, right? So you can really shrink your ROM. All right. That pretty much covers most of what I wanted to go over. And uh, I think I'll just... Uh, I think I'll stop with that. Let's see if we can blow this up here. So, um, so that should hopefully uh, give you a little bit of a feel for how how we can use SM charts and how you can use microcoding. Now, like I said, uh, we don't you know the micro the strict microcoding is not really uh, is not used that all that much, but it, but it's a it's a close variant on that. It's really a little micro machine that runs underneath your your you know that actually executes uh, the instructions for you, and and the reason it's set up that way is so that you can have great uh, flexibility and the ability to to do things like multi-stage pipelining and branch prediction and all sorts of things. Um, and if you don't have it set up as a, if you just tried to hardwire that, 
it, it would be impossible. Uh, just no way, and you could never get it debugged. Um, all right, I think that um, uh, pretty much covers everything. So uh, we will see you then uh, next week.